Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Mindful Muslim podcast. On this episode, I will be speaking with Brother Ahmed Tomal and Abu Musa, and they share their knowledge, their experience, their work. We talk about mental health and addiction and lots more. Inshallah, you find this episode useful. I will see you on the next one. Jazakallah khair. Great, bismillah. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today on the Mindful Muslim podcast. It's amazing to have you, Ahmed and Abu Musa, today. Assalamu alaikum. It's good to be here. Assalamu alaikum. So I guess I'll start with you, Ahmed. It would be great if you introduced yourself to our audience. Um, tell us what you do in your day-to-day -day work. Okay. So, um, alhamdulillah, my name is Ahmed Tumal. I'm a qualified and registered counsellor and psychotherapist. I have my own private practice. I also work with organisations like in spirited minds, as well as my Tuskia, yeah, I'm doing that. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I generally work with general mental health issues, anything from um, anxiety related issues to anger management. Um, I also do a lot of couples work as well. And my uh, work generally with my Tuskia has a lot to do with addiction. Okay. Amazing. Um, Abu Musa, same question to you, really. Yes, yeah, Salaamu Alaikum. Jazakallah khair for inviting us on the podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, but yeah, my uh, background is uh, with youth work. So I'm a former youth worker mm -hmm. and currently a coach and co-founder at uh, Mataskia. Amazing. So um, you've both mentioned this uh, organization, Mataskia. I'm sure our yeah. audience are, are really interested to know um, what that is, um, what organization it is and, and when you started and why you started it. Yeah, so Mataskia is an organization through which we help Muslims uh, struggling with uh, pornography addiction or sexually destructive behaviors or anything related to that um, and it's basically an eight stage program uh, consisting of various different things you know orientation the importance of breaking isolation developing uh, you know community that, that kind of recovery community and um, being a part of people who have been where you know an addict may uh, be going through and uh, know the problem and the solution and through the stages we also work on um, the underlying causes and conditions, you know, some therapy, counselling work and um, also a big part of it is helping people reconnect to the deen, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, core, con core concepts of our deen which I think are very closely related to mental health, uh, aspects like tawheed, uh, aspects like tawakkal in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dhan, thinking good of Allah, so we work on these aspects. One stage consists of meditation and it's basically like, you know, uh, a mixture of things you know through trial and error and years of experience mm -hmm. um i personally have been in the field of addiction recovery for about 12 years now since 2009 start off uh, started off doing some youth work and that's how it developed you know this problem kept coming up a problem of pornography um, people would mention it online on forums at college university and we thought you know it's about time that we reach out and help people and Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought like-minded people uh, around us. And that's how we developed the team. And we finally put ourselves out there as a platform in 2017-18. Alhamdulillah, it's been going well. Uh, you know, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have been getting good results. A lot of people, uh, you know, recovering and life being changed, Alhamdulillah. Amazing. Um, You mentioned, Abu Musa, the eight stages, I think. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and sort of... Um, how it all came about was it based on research that you you and your team conducted yeah yeah so initially it was like you know the kind of drug and alcohol addiction recovery work mm -hmm. uh, kind of um, as we were speaking just before uh, there was a local youth project in my area and they were helping a lot of these street active individuals who were addicted to drugs and alcohol and a lot of them wouldn't even realize that they're addicted you know people think it's recreational but um they they were addicted basically you know they won't be able to let go of that lifestyle and uh, this youth engagement center basically just helped them with training employment education they did simple classes like box exercise exercise classes and basically got them uh, busy with life right you know they got them um, kind of gave them these pathways 
to um, channel that energy. They were just bored youth around the area, not much to do, uh, maybe didn't have a good nurturing environment. And just because they were helped into training, employment, education, that helped a lot of them change their lives, right? Go back into studies, go back into work. Um, so simple things like these were effective. Um, and Alhamdulillah, you know, um, I, s I saw that, the, the effect that it had, and I was involved in it as well. And uh, this later on, basically, you know, these kind of things I started applying to people. And it was like, kind of, just through research, experience, just trialing things out. And um, then, you know, in 2015-16, that's when we started to get a bit more serious it into like a format because of course there needs to be a structure for people to go through and uh, discipline because addicts do struggle with that there's a lot of procrastination and kind of all over the place right when they're in active addiction um so the eight stages basically the first three stages are orientation stages uh, getting people used to um reaching out breaking isolation like someone who is a heroin addict has to go to a rehabilitation center and they need to uh, talk to people with similar problems, maybe people who have been sober from the drug for years, and they have to reach out to a counselor, maybe a therapist, and someone you know who can mentor them out of that problem. So we emphasize this, that you need to reach out. And that basically, what that does is that helps them rewire the brain, right? Because they come in, when they come to us, they come with an active uh, addiction lifestyle, like there's that addiction blueprint. And what we try to do through recovery work is to change that addiction blueprint to a sobriety blueprint. Um, and, you know, one of the stages is just to develop, the beginning stage is like develop that recovery network. Mm -hmm. So what we say is, you know, because an addict, uh, there's a lot of internal issues going on. So because they've been watching certain, uh, certain type of material, this explosive material for years or decades, uh, it's deeply embedded within their brains. It's disturbing them. You know, we get up to, I believe there's different studies done thousands of thoughts per day. So an addict, a, a pornography addict will get a lot of these thoughts of images and videos popping up. So through their recovery network, through them reaching out, we, we give accountability partners when they join. We basically try to um, help them rewire the brain. So instead of those images coming up and you going towards that addiction pathway, you call someone, you reach out, you go to the gym. Um, you know, you provide these different avenues like that kind of youth project was doing for these street active young people, drug and alcohol addiction. Um, and then, you know, going on, we kind of work on the third stage is like your daily routine. Again, they come in with that addictive lifestyle. So we try to switch it up. You know, it's like an electrical circuit. We try to interrupt that electrical circuit, interrupt it, disrupt it and replace it with a sobriety based lifestyle. Um, and then it goes on, like I was mentioning about the relationship with Allah SWT. So a lot of people we're dealing with are practicing people, but um, sometimes there's a lot of conditioning, there's a lot of backlog that has messed around, interfered with with their relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we just try to emphasize those basic concepts, Amazing. you know, your relationship with Allah and these kind of things, and then it goes on to do a bit of therapy, but similar things to cognitive behavioral therapy, not actual cognitive behavioral therapy, but like worksheets to find out. Why am I feeling this emotion? Why am I feeling angry? What's behind this? Why am I feeling tempted to act out and go watch pornography? What's happened an hour before? What's happened a few hours before? What's happened days before? Um, and you know, these kind of things that um, we work on. I'd love to get in a little bit um, deeper later on in terms of um, more about the stages as well. And um, the, the support that you've described, it sounds very, very comprehensive and, and robust yeah. for people. So it'd be amazing to hear later, perhaps about um, if somebody has in their, somebody sees this in themselves and they would like to get seek yeah. help, how could they do that? Or indeed somebody else supporting a family member, whoever it may be to, yeah. to, actually, to actually come to your organization perhaps. Um, but it's led me on to another question about what are some of the common causes of, of pornography addiction? Mm -hmm. um, in your experience, what has that been um, for, yeah. for the majority or, or is there not trends that you've noticed? Yeah, there's definitely themes that addicts have, you know, I describe it like an iceberg, right? You know, on the top of the iceberg, you see the problem above the waters. That problem could be pornography addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction. But that's a symptom. 
right? We need to deal with the root cause of the problem, what is driving them. And that's why we say the problem is not so much the acting out, it's acting in what's going on underneath the waters and that could be uh, various different things you know like mental health issues commonly it could be stress anxiety their stress response how they view the world their conditioning their behavioral patterns trauma ptsd uh, and it's normally a mixture of things it doesn't have to be that a person has gone through a specific trauma it could be uh, you know maybe some people have gone through physical abuse sexual abuse and that is a big part of it but from our experience what we have seen is a mixture of things that has developed into that conditioning that is fueling that addictive lifestyle and uh, that's what we try to work on mm. you know, through, uh, S- sometimes it's really also just the environment that they've grown up in so most people who access porn they do it from a young age mm. so that's where it starts at a young age and there are a few reasons as to why children access porn and it could be helpful for us to maybe look at them so one of the reasons is for education, right? We live in a very sexualized society. There's a lot of pressure on teenagers, yeah. not Muslim, non-Muslim, Muslims as well, to uh, who are unfortunately who don't have a religious environment to um, engage in certain things. There are social pressures regarding sexuality, etc. So then, um, where do they tend to learn? They tend to porn. So a lot of young people, they tend to porn as a form of education. This is really dangerous because it's a completely distorted version of what intimacy really is like. Mm. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason why a child might enter porn, might start watching it, is because um, it sort of becomes a gateway into either masculinity or femininity. So it's a case Mm. of peer bonding. So I've got a group of friends, they're sharing images with each other, or an older brother or a sibling or something like that. So it becomes literally a gateway into masculinity or femininity where they connect with other uh, men or boy, young men through porn mm-hmm. and yes. they bond like that. Mm-hmm. So that's another reason. Another thing is, um, another it, 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 it's a lot to what Abu Musa was alluding to as well. It becomes a um, an escape from emotional issues. Mm-hmm. So often it's not, I mean, um, addiction is really... Addiction has a lot to do with one's ability to participate in life, Mm. right? So some of the stages that my Tuskia go through really helps the individual go back and participate in life, deal with their um, social problems that they may have, the emotional connections that they don't have right now with their, you know, who who do you have around you? That kind of thing, your social network, your spiritual network. That's one of the things that my Tuskia really does emphasize on, which is, is, is the spiritual relationship with Allah, because that can be an enormously um, powerful tool to help someone in the path of sobriety. So those were three reasons. Uh, there are other reasons as to why children also access it. Some of it has to do with permission and pleasure. The fact that it is a desire, you know, you know, th- their body is changing at that point. It's very accessible. You know, the AAA effect definitely is there, which is that there's, um, th- they can do it. It's, it's, it's easily accessible. It's affordable. In the case of porn, it's free mm-hmm. and it's anonymous. So nobody knows. They can just do it. It's a secret mm-hmm. pleasure, that type of thing. So, um, yeah, these are some of the reasons as to why people mm-hmm. that's, enter that field. Thank you. That's that's um, really, really helpful to hear and to break that down a bit for us. Um, I wonder, is there advice that, that you guys can give to, to parents potentially or indeed older siblings mm-hmm. or, or families in terms of... Is it more sort of being open within our families? Is it, I mean, I would really hope that if I have older children that they can come to me and talk to me about anything. How can we sort of foster those kind of relationships where our children can speak to us rather than feeling like they can't talk about this matter and it has to be very, very sort of, um, you know, kept to themselves. Mm-hmm. I think, like uh, Saad Ahmed Amal has mentioned, it starts off with the environment. So as parents, I feel that's the first thing we need to do, be involved parents, involve fathers, involve mothers, and build that nurturing environment, healthy environment for our children, and uh, make them feel connected, make them feel loved, accepted, and um, 
make them feel comfortable like you've mentioned so they can mention these things to you if they are suffering or if they have come across something mm -hmm. because if they don't feel comfortable coming to you they are going to feel comfortable going to their friends and like uh, the brother mentioned that you know it kind of can be a route to that uh, masculinity femininity issue because i remember one comment on a video was like if you're not watching it at school you're seen as the odd one out subhanallah mm -hmm. so it's to that extent so it starts off with, by building that healthy environment um, but what I also advise is it's not the whole solution, but it is part of the solution to have filters in our homes. And we don't take this seriously because we warn our children about drug addiction, alcohol addiction. Um, we're told this by Allah SWT in the Quran, but we're also told uh, by Allah SWT, Wala takrabu zina. do not go near zina. Right? So we're warned about this issue of lust as well and that we have to protect ourselves. Um, but we, I don't think there's enough education and awareness within our communities, within our homes. So it's important to educate your children about these. I mean, even from an Islamic perspective, you know, scholars mentioned that teaching young children at the age of five, six about not showing, you know, your, your kind of private parts around adults and these kind of like things. You know, I was reading some articles, but going on. Uh, when they grow older, I think it's important for them to, you know, first of all, starting off with the filters. So anyone watching this, I always try to do this just to remind and get people active, <coughs> is to buy tonight. And if not, let's have a deadline, you know, because we are driven by kind of targets, right? So anyone watching this, inshallah, by tomorrow night, try to install filters within your home, right? Go to your, you can go uh, to your internet provider and block all adult content coming into your home so you can set a password and that can protect um, your kind of like uh, internet and then we want multi-layer protection beyond that we recommend apps there's something called custodio it's covenant eyes focus me we recommend custodio is a parental controlling app uh, where you have the parents version and then you have the kids version so you know a uh, mother or father can install the parents version and then you can have the children's version on all other devices in your home and it's very good uh, because it will block all adult content and beyond that you can uh, block the amount of time that they're on it you can block certain apps the data that they use and if anything inappropriate does pop up it will flag your parent app we do that and secondly you want to educate your children so we can talk to them and tell them look you know my son my daughter if you see something explicit an explicit pop-up come on your laptop or on your phone when you're working um, or doing your homework what are you going to do a are you going to click on that pop-up b are you going to close that pop-up or c are you going to come and talk to me about it and we want to drive them towards C, right? Getting them comfortable in talking to us as parents about it. Like this has come up. And let them know that there is things out there like drugs and alcohol. There are indus industries out there, multi-billion dollar industries. It's a dangerous world. It can destroy lives, destroy marriages. Um, and inform them of the dangers. Because I would say 90% of the people I've dealt with all have mentioned that the first time they came across this material was quite innocently them online w playing on playing a game watching a movie so it all starts off from there and we have to be more proactive we can no longer be reactive we have to be proactive with the community because the world is changing rapidly and we're going towards this virtual world right like the metaverse and so on so things will only get worse so we definitely have to be proactive as a community inshallah absolutely i think yeah. the bit really struck me abu musa about if our child sees something and they need to come to us. If they have questions, they need to come to us as parents. Yes. Um, have you found the same thing, Ahmed? Do you think that would be? 100%. We need to foster better relationships with our children. And that starts young, right? But that doesn't... It's, it's a couple of comments that the brother made really struck with me, is to be involved parents, involved fathers, involved mothers. And to be able to provide that secure base for our child where they do feel comfortable to be able to come in talk to us and for us to be able to contain their emotions and not let our anxieties and worries about what that question might mean mm. overtake us is really important mm. so if they do mm. see kind of having an emotional reaction to it or being very exactly worried exactly mm. yeah the thing is naturally we would because mm -hmm. it triggers our own anxiety mm. we see our children they've just come across something we don't want to you know our natural instinct is to protect them 
right? So when we feel like there's something that could be dangerous to that, dangerous to their future, we become worried because that's anxiety. That's what anxiety yeah. essentially is. It's a worry that something right. bad is going to happen. So we become worried that they're going to, you know, loads of different scenarios go through our mind. But it's, uh, you know, even if we have to just take a deep breath, take a step back to be able to react to that child properly and say, okay, you saw that, that's uh, not your fault. You're not in trouble. Because mm -hmm. sometimes anxious reactions might yeah. uh, make them feel as if they've done something wrong there. You're not in trouble. Um, we can talk about it later. Let yourself calm down. Take a step back. Then go back and approach your child and say, you know, um, you know, you know, th th this is a part. It's not. Allah has created certain parts for us which are private. Mm -hmm. Islam is really a, a religion which does uh, promote haya, modesty, is uh, enormously and rightfully so, right? And that's the fitrah of the child. Anyway, they've come to you because they've seen something which tells them I shouldn't be seeing this, mm -hmm. right? And you just reinforce that. Say, okay, you did the right thing. You know, these things are there. They're there because they're, you know, the, the shaitan has his role in society, in misguiding people. And this is the aspect that it has. But thank you for coming to me, etc. And having that kind of conversation is really important. Amazing. Definitely. Yeah. So, so helpful to, to have this, I'm sure, to lots of viewers and listeners right now. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the next thing I want to move on to is um, what are some of the mo most common or some common misconceptions that you've come across in terms of pornography and our, our lack of education there for either of you? So uh, what it is, is a mixture of things, right? Like I have said before, some people may have this pornogra pornography problem and they get married and it's gone away, right? So some people may not be addicted, but then there's the other extreme where a lot of people are in denial um, a lot. And that basically delays people reaching out and getting help because um, we get a lot of kind of sisters contacting us about their husband's problem. And I remember one case where the sister was mentioned, I don't know if it was our organization, I read something online, the sister was mentioning that the husband said, everyone does it, it's normal, just kind of get over it. Um, and this could be very damaging. Like why is the husband turning towards this when you have a halal outlet, you have your spouse? And the dangers with this is that, you know, we have these parts of the brain. That Allah SWT has created and it's that drive for us to you know those survival mechanisms hormones like dopamine and they also um, have you know give us that drive to procreate and, and and so on so what pornography addiction does people really you know get addicted and addict gets bonded to that pornography right so it's really messing around with those brain chemicals that the the, the person is supposed to be bonded to is spouse and we even have a sister final we've had sisters married you know females who have the problem so it can work the other way around as well mm. um and what that does is because they've been watching this material and they have this addiction for years or decades they find it hard to transition from that to this spouse and these are the dangers so what i say is people who reach out to us my Taskia, or any other organization a counselor a therapist mm -hmm. they definitely have a big problem for them to reach out no one will reach out if they don't have uh, you know an issue right because it's not easy to reach out mm. so there's that aspect like there's two extremes right so what we say is um if you have a problem you want to get the solution sooner rather than later you know in in Mataskia, we normally recommend six months sobriety six months to a year and that's because yes going in six months uh, six months to a year of sobriety before they go into marriage and why we say that is yes this could cause issues with intimacy, physical issues, but more than that are the emotional and spiritual issues. Because the thing is with addicts, right? I remember one individual mentioning that he's six years old and he was, in, I believe, in his 40s. And I was thinking in my mind, how are you six? So he mentioned that I stopped growing the day I became an addict, right? So now I'm emotionally six years old because I started developing again when I stopped using escapism so imagine a 10 year old 11 year old finds this material online and as science tells us that they've done experiments and they've seen someone taking heroin and someone watching pornography and similar changes are taking place in the brain so that dopamine release is insane very abnormal and now they get this feeling of high so they keep using it. it starts off quite innocently that intrigue you know there's that natural kind of you know desire that individuals have but then this kind of plays with that and really uh, manipulates that part of the brain so now they get this high feeling so 
they will start turning towards it when they're feeling low, when they feel isolated, maybe issues at home. It could be domestic violence, bullying, stress at school, exams, GCSE, SATs, college, union. This is how it continues. So they're feeling low. Where is their brain going to direct them towards? The brain is going to direct them towards those neural pathways are going to push them towards that thing that is giving them that high, that escape from this challenge. So they stop dealing with life and they stop learning emotional intelligence. So they're going through stress um, with SATs or GCSEs and they're going towards pornography or weed, alcohol, you can, there's a lot of similarities. Um, and if we keep escaping our life challenges, we stop growing because we don't learn how to deal with this challenge. So the stress response gets weak, right? The anxiety grows. And, you know, basically there's that lack of development, emotional development. So these are the things that are more dangerous for an addict, you know, growing up an, as an adult. So it could be that a person is 25 years old and he's married, but uh, on an emotional level, He's still a teenager, you know, subhanAllah. So this is why, why we say that in that six months, more than the physical sobriety, you want that emotional sobriety, nice. you know, because you're going into marriage and it's a beautiful thing. It's a, you know, blessed mm. union, but it has its own set of challenges. And I think a lot of the individuals that come to us that are on the brink of divorce, I think this is a major part of the issue. Like they've been divorcees that have come and uh, obviously they have, various different issues but this was definitely a big part of it you know so i think it's, it's about um realizing where you are in your journey and and self-assessing i mean there are some tests you can conduct as well online about you know uh, addiction sexual addictions and so on but i think is it's quite simple when it comes to um realizing if you have the problem or not um ahmed back to you it would be great to hear um some of the other damaging effects maybe that you could extend on that Abu, Abu Musa has spoken about already. Um, so there's that emotional aspect and turning to turning to pornography at any stressful situation that happens. Are, is there any other kind of damaging effects that would that you'd like to highlight in the work that you've you've done? Pornography is extremely damaging. It's extremely damaging. Again, to reiterate, any sort of form of addiction is really a failure for one's ability to participate in life, right? It becomes uh, an emotional escape more than anything else. So let's take it back to one's childhood, right? Not saying this is the exact reason, just to give you an example as to why someone might want to escape from certain things. So I'll paint you a picture of a young child, right? This young child is um, three or four, four years old. They're seeing mom and dad shout. They're seeing mom and dad screaming at each other. Right, things might get violent. Things, whatever might happen. Now, that child can respond in many ways. Perhaps that child now screams or cries. What's the function of that? Is to get their attention, to stop them from doing it, because that's within its control, right? Then it tries to distract them. Hey, look, I've got a toy. Look, I'm so I'm I can do this. I can do that. Tries to make them happy. That's the second. So again, it's within its control. So it's tried. It's exhausted its efforts to do what it can when it's within the remit that it has. Right, it's cried, it's tried to make them happy, it's used what it can. And it hasn't worked, they're still fighting, the situation is very anxious, it still feels dangerous. What does a child now do to help themselves cope with that? Mm -hmm. They withdraw. They withdraw and they escape and they pretend like nothing is happening. And they're just playing with their toys. And you might think my child is such a good child. No, your child is escaping right now. It's gone into another zone, right? Now, at that point, that coping mechanism was needed. That child needed that coping mechanism in order to survive that situation. But now let's fast forward into the future. So now that child's in school, right? It feels another negative emotion now. It's bored in class. How does it deal with it? It escapes, right? Continue to go, for, you know, let's look fast forward into other life situations that child might be in, right? Exam stress, work stress, uh, marital stresses. Right? Marriage can be the best thing in your life or it can be one of the worst things in your life. Yeah. I tell a lot of couples who work in porn addiction definitely is an issue there. But um, how do they deal with it? Again, it's an escape from your emotions. One of the emotions that actually a lot of people try to escape from when watching porn, and it's sad to really say this, but I guess it's a, it's kind of a... Um, a uh, it says a lot about the time, it says a lot about the situation that we live in as a society. It's to escape from boredom. Right, we live in an extremely stimulating society. Everything is always extremely stimulating, like the medium through which porn comes as well. Because porn has existed for a very long time, but it's internet pornography that is really the issue, because the media is 
easily accessible, the variety is endless, and the medium through which it comes has an effect which has been uh, similar to gambling, right? So the slot machine effect. You put money into a slot machine, you, you press it, you wait for it, and it's like, okay, maybe next time. Maybe next time. It did, <laughs> did anyone ever, when they were little, do the 2P machines or the 10P little slot thingies when they were little, when they went to like Brighton yeah. or whatever? Yeah. So we were young. I, you know, uh, The Muslim community, alhamdulillah, has become more religiously conscious over time. But many of us didn't grow up with that kind of upbringing. So that we may have done that, but it's like, I'm just giving that example to show, okay, look, it's so much closer now. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to get that thing. So when it comes to, when it comes to pornography use, and I'm going to extend that to other things like social media as well, Social media is designed in that same kind of way. When you're scrolling, mm-hmm. you, when you find yourself lost in scrolling, right? It's because a part of you is thinking, okay, that next post is gonna might be something interesting. That next post might be might be even better. Let me just carry on. That might be, and that's what keeps you going. It's that same effect. So the way society is, you know, these things are kind of designed to keep you hooked, right? And internet pornography is a part of that. But we go back to the effects of it, right? So um, it becomes an escape for emotional pain. Essentially, and not just emotional pain. I would actually lessen that and say, say just general discomfort. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the key uh, points in dealing with porn addiction is to be able to deal with discomfort better, mm-hmm. right? Whether that be hunger, whether that be anger, whether that be um, boredom, mm-hmm. loneliness, just general discomfort, stress better. Your capacity to be able to endure the stresses of life more, uh, to increase that, will help you in your Path of addi- in your path of addiction, whether that be porn, whether that be weed, whether that be anything else, right? Now, I think I went on a tangent. I might do that a few times. What was your question? Please repeat that. <laughs> Carry on. We were just talking about. Um, my question was regarding the impacts of porn. The impacts of yeah. porn, and and some Abu Musa did mention in terms of ruining relationships and marriages yeah. and families. On on that note, there. So look, there are obvious um, um, impacts of porn that everybody knows. Mm. Right, we're talking about uh, one's uh, ability to be intimate that is affected. Mm-hmm. Um, now, um, as with any addiction, the, the 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 type of drug that they have generally, what they find is that their capacity to find pleasure from that uh, uh, decreases. So the quantity that they need or the type that they need increases. The tolerance level, that's the word I was looking for. The tolerance level changes. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to uh, porn, it impacts uh, that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. The ability to be to, to be with one's partner. Now, um, I would say that doesn't, you know, when we talk about porn, we're, you know, people often think about hardcore stuff. Mm-hmm. But the definition of porn has really changed. Yeah. You know, we have, uh, as, as Muslims, as you know, we're generally we are more conservative mm-hmm. and uh, perhaps more in line with the, the fitra. In, in essence, right? Which is that, and and we have to understand that movies, for example, when we were young, that were, you know, classified as 15, mm-hmm. right? Or 18, might actually be a 12 now. There's some pretty hardcore stuff out there that is just very easily accessible on Netflix and things like that. And that is impacting both men and women. So uh, it is porn has distorted both the husband and wife perhaps as well understanding of what intimacy is mm-hmm. and the reality of it and um and it impacts the ability to be with each other one of the points that the brother made Abu Musa made mashallah had to do with this this thing when we're talking about porn and we're talking about this kind of issue right we're saying we're, we're messing with the we're messing with biology mm-hmm. essentially we're messing with biology now um now um physical touch releases a chemical and hormone called oxytocin now, oxytocin is a bonding chemical. It's designed to make you feel connected to the other person. So when you shake hands with someone, there's a level of connection. When you give them a hug, there's a level of connection. Now, that uh, increases the more we carry on. So in the act of intimacy, right, that's when you know Allah has created a man and woman to find mercy, love and mercy, compassion, comfort within each other. That action is what creates and maintains the love. That it's it's the only thing that really separates the relationship between a husband and wife compared to a man and a woman in any other dynamics that they have, mm. right? Is that so? Yeah. Sometimes and um, yeah, it's that. So um, think about uh, w- w- when someone is um, watching pornography and doing what they're doing, they're connecting with an image. Mm-hmm. 
they're connecting with something which is other, which isn't real, which is a fantasy. And there's an emotional comfort that they may get from that, but it's not real. And it leaves people feeling quite disconnected, even to their spouse later on, right? Yeah. So emotional, um, I've, I've lost myself. <laughs> emotional damage is what you were, yeah, you were talking about. I was, I was talking about that's one of the consequences of it. You begin to connect with an, a fantasy mm. and, and an image which isn't reality. And then that separates the connection with with the spouse and your ability to be intimate with them. And that goes both ways with husband and wives. Men tend to be more uh, visually stimulated, so therefore porn might be there. With women, it's, it tends to be more a case of reading things, mm. right? The, that kind of content. And that's there as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Abu Musa also mentioned before that um, within the organization, you have come across sisters that have this... Um, uh, that may be ad addicted to to pornography as well. Does your organization cater for them specifically in a in a different way or? Um? Yes, yeah, so we have um, a female section mm -hmm. and we have female coaches, alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. and um, We know it's not easy to reach out and that's something we've been working on uh, Quite a bit anonymity aspect and we have made our program anonymous alhamdulillah mm -hmm. You can sign up anonymously with a nickname anonymous email and so on and sisters I think it's hard enough for a male to reach out, so for females it's harder. But uh, Alhamdulillah, sisters are reaching out, you know, they're go going beyond the comfort zone. So we have that section. Obviously it's not as busy as the, the male side. Um, but if um, anyone feels that they need to reach out, then uh, when they do reach out, after the email they'll be directed to uh, the sister section straight away. Mm -hmm. Like the admin, his wife is uh, one of the coaches. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, so you know, we try to keep it as comfortable as possible for a sister. Mm -hmm. We also have a spouse support group. Um, so uh, sisters whose husbands are suffering from the addiction. Mm -hmm. So inshallah, if um, anyone is going through that, they can feel free to reach out mm -hmm. as well. We have a group where we try to uh, provide the help as well. But they're going through the same program. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, they're going through the same program as the brothers. Um, yeah. I guess this is a this is a good point to ask both of you about any kind of um, stories or cases that you would feel comfortable sharing yeah. within within the topic that we're talking about today. Yeah. There's loads of stories, subhanAllah. I mean, there's some success stories or loads of success stories, alhamdulillah, um, where brothers have joined our program and they've managed to uh, get sober from the addiction or at least develop that emotional stability and have gone on to get married, alhamdulillah, um, at brothers with you know years of sobriety, getting married. Uh, and uh, I just had a talk recently with a brother who joined our program and is married, he was six months sober. So there's that aspect, uh, I mean- I don't think that aspect can be underestimated, mm. right? Yeah. It's, it's the basic need that human beings have to yeah. feel connected with people yeah. and that's done through marriage. Understood. So if couples, if human beings are, they're benefiting from the program where they feel more emotionally stable that they're able to go and get married and have that kind of stage of their life then it's, it's a it's a big success yeah it's a major thing it's like um uh what was i going to say with so with regards to the question yet yeah, were you asking about success stories or like the kind of horror stories of the impacts both, of the addiction both would, both. Be, would be great to okay. hear about anything so. that kind of has really stayed with you any yeah. cases There's a lot either way it, it kind of goes back to the consequences of porn again as well and it's that you find that people, you know, I, I'll kind of give an example of, um, you know, relating to something else, right? Of the way porn can kind of lead somebody. So you might go onto YouTube, right? And you might just research, for example, something mundane, right? Like uh, things in my environment, things in my city, interesting things about my city, right? Then the next search all of a sudden, because you're going down the rabbit hole here, right? The next search will take you to, for example, um, um, famous people in your environment Then the next search will all of a sudden The options will take you to scandals That happen in your environment Then the next search will take you to something else Right? And you're going down a rabbit hole there And the same thing happens with porn People might um, initially start watching porn And they're watching um, Perhaps not even porn They're watching movies Right? You're, um, I've never actually watched it But everybody knows the whole uh, Game of Thrones And what it's famous for in some kind of sense That kind of aspect but, um, you know, it's got it's explicit scenes. They might be watching that and it's presented in a, in, in a, in a story format so people are more inclined to see it, but it's impacting them. So they might just do that and then it will go to perhaps just porn, which they will 
describe as mundane Very harmful but I'm talking about the wider society You might just describe it as normal stuff And then it will the, you know, the tolerance level is different now So the more they watch it, it will, it will change And it will change and it will change To a point where now they're finding themselves Seeing things that they're shocked about Right, they find, you know, that perhaps I'm not sure if this is the correct environment To speak about some of these things, right I'm conscious of that But um, they, they, what they see and what they find pleasure from Has has continued to um, take them to a place Where they're not happy anymore mm-hmm. It doesn't sit with their values anymore Their way of life, their morals when they look back at themselves, things okay, I'm actually we're doing that. They can't see themselves in the mirror, so that's a really uncomfortable place to be in when you can't look at yourself in the mirror anymore. When you don't feel comfortable in yourself because of because of these types of things, these types of content. So you can just let your imagination go there in terms of the type, you know, where it may go from one thing to another. You've had people, for example, men who have um, from finding heterosexual porn. Pleasurable to f- going into things which are uh, which question their own sexuality, mm-hmm. right? These types of things, and that just continues. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that's where it is. Like um, with regards to what the brother was saying, something that came to mind about um, pornography, right? Like what we try to say is uh, we have to be very rational and logical, right? That's therapy. We need to look at it from a different angle. So what we try to tell addicts that you are not your addiction, right? Separate yourself from the inner addict. You know the whole concept of you did a bad thing, but you are not the bad thing. And these are the things people struggle from, like their past experiences, that conditioning, their self-esteem. And uh, because they are merged with that entity and they think that, I am this person and they have beliefs you know the common beliefs like I'm a bad person I'm evil or, and then it I'm just compounds pervert. everything it and they're compounds. not able to to reach out to anybody then yeah because you know they're overwhelmed with guilt shame despair so what we say is as we're told the Prophet sallallahu said every one of us has been assigned a qareen we know that there is an entity right within us that whispers in the hearts of men as we're told in the Quran, we, uh, you know, those who whisper in the hearts of jinn kind and mankind. So we are not. We know that there are entities and recognize these entities, right? A lot of this was worse is coming from external entities. It's not you, and that really provides them with that aha moment, that realization that wow, I'm watching this stuff. Maybe I've been like you know influenced heavily by it, but that's not me, you know, because a lot of individuals will complain that um going about my day-to-day life and I'm ob- objectifying the opposite uh, sex and so on mm-hmm. and you know they feel very bad about that but what you got to look at is you're watching this material for years decades so what has happened is become embedded within your brain and now you're seeing the world through a sexual filter but that is not you right separate that and work on yourself um, and that's what we try to like you know help individuals do that and uh, that really kind of helps them you know because then they realize that I'm not this person, I'm a good person. Like I tell individuals coming into my tazkiyah, you've come out, you're reaching out for help, you're trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're, 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 you're an amazing person. You're, you know, you're this individual, a good individual, who has this problem and you're trying to come away from it. Right? And even with pornography, like we have to look at what is pornography doing for them. Right? So an individual when they are watching the pornography or when they are smoking weed when they are drinking alcohol a person is present in the moment yeah they're not thinking about the past they're not thinking about the future because these substances they release as i was mentioning dopamine other hormones as well like uh, brother was mentioning oxytocin and so on Um, so what that does is that helps them to live in the moment and be present right Um, and they are not worried at that time they are you know, in a so-called state of contentment and peace, but it is t- very temporary. It's for maybe 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, maybe a couple of hours. And it's very destructive because there's that tolerance aspect and it's just making uh, the, um, uh, you know, emotional stability, it's worsening the emotional stability and so on. And the situations that they are going through are not getting any better. I mean, a person may drink one night to get over their problem, the argument with the wife or something. They're going to wake up the next morning and the problem is still going to be there. And to add to that, they're going to find it more difficult to deal with that problem now because they've escaped it, they're worsening their um, their kind of, you know, uh, brain chemicals and so on. So what we say 
through recovery work is that what is that pornography providing you and we want to through recovery we want to provide them with what pornography was providing them mm. minus the haram aspect mm. obviously so this is where we say self-care yes yeah, so one of the things i recommend uh, individuals when i coach them when they come in i ask them like what are you doing to enjoy life mm. right what are you doing as recreational activities and not everyone but a lot of addicts are very isolated they're not enjoying life mm. they're not going out there and they're not doing things that they were maybe doing as children as teenagers right so what i say is reconnect with that inner child Re do the things that like a lot of people come from like jahiliya right so come from a background maybe maybe with uh, drug addiction alcohol addiction or a non-practicing background so i say again do the things that you were doing right before islam as long as they're halal minus the haram aspect so get in touch with your local park Play football like you used to play, right? Do these things as long as we're fulfilling the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, it's a blessing. Like my own experience when I, I started to practice Islam, alhamdulillah, my sister got married and my brother-in-law was uh, a very practicing individual. Before that, I always had this because I didn't have that environment around me. So I thought if you become practicing, you become a saint and you just don't enjoy life anymore. You're and you're boring. <laughs> But I saw that my brother-in-law, mashallah, he grew up in the East and amazing individual, he was reading his salah, active, going to lectures. And then after we go for meals, he was like the funniest guy I knew, always enjoying, always happy, laughing, smiling. And I saw a different side. And that really um, inspired me. I was like, man, you know, this, this guy is really enjoying his life. And that was one of the things, you know, obviously there was a few things going on. That's so important. Yeah. Because re really what you're alluding to kind of there is, the relationship there, right? Yeah. To have that kind of person in your life, to have that relationship, yeah, to have, have someone mentor, to go one with. Of the had, it's, yeah. it's, 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 just, it's just so valuable. And yeah. one of the things that my Tazkiyah, uh, again, provides is the is that support. Mm -hmm. We go back to the ability for the person to participate in life, no, no, no. to socialize with people, to meet, to get these, these types of needs met. And um, to have that kind of support network yeah. is so important. So like one of the things I mentioned is write down, like obviously this is separate from the stages, but I say write down how are you going to enjoy your life for the s next six to 12 so months. They can almost see the end point, almost, yeah, almost, uh, almost the after the eight stages and after they've yeah. gone through this process with your support, yeah. they can envisage this is where I'll be. I'll be enjoying my life and I'll be doing all of these things and my needs will be met yeah, through sure. these ways, which is actually leading on to my next question about what does that recovery look like? You know, I'm, I'm sure it's an ongoing process in terms of trying to remain on that path, mm -hmm. but also is it just very, very individual and case by case? Or are there certain things that you guys can talk about where, you know, a person goes through the process and, 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 and they've, they've done all the stages? Um, what should their life be like, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of fulfillment? So basically, what I say is recovery is for life. Right. You know, we have like a 12 week program at the moment and then the monthly program, 12 week one is a coaching program. And I say recovery is not for 12 weeks. Recovery is for life, mm -hmm. because if the problem was the pornography on its own, mm -hmm. then yes, after 12 weeks, you just carry on with your life. But the problem was not the pro pornography all along. The problem was what was driving you towards the pornography. So you may become sober from the pornography. But if you're not dealing with those underlying causes and conditions, mm -hmm. We have people who like will be sober for a year or two, but then they'll go back uh, to the addiction, right? Active addiction, because they stop caring about you know taking care of the real underlying causes. So we give them that uh, kind of structure and that discipline, right? Where they they try to navigate the emotions and process what is going on, um, and then we say you know it's like we could say we give them like a spiritual toolbox mm -hmm. so they start off recovery and they start learning all these different things uh dopamine substitution how do i transmute that sexual energy um all these recovery tools urge coping mechanisms um processing your emotions meditation learning to live in the moment you know as i was saying when a person is acting out their drug they are in the moment so when we say meditation a lot of people maybe in the muslim community have that you know um understanding that some people are not too keen on meditation, but we're not talking about 
that meditation where you have to go to a Shaolin temple, you know, do thousands of hours of meditation. None of the theological connotations no. that come with it, perhaps more just kind of mindfulness. Mindfulness. But even not yeah. the theological connotations that come with that, just being yeah. present, deep breathing in the moment. In yeah. the moment. And uh, you know, um, you know, you know what the Sahaba would do to relax, to cope with their boredom? Athkar. Right? It's in their moment. They didn't escape into some sort of pleasure seeking kind of thing that I personally believe society has struck kind of, you know, the, the, the society we essentially grow up in shapes us in many kind of ways. And we live in a globalized community now. So it's not just, you know, people in uh, Saudi Arabia or Bangladesh aren't from a different culture necessarily anymore. They may be, but the, the internet has changed things. Mm. But um, yeah, they, they would do a thkar. that Just to be there yeah. present in the moment, that would be their relaxation. It might not sound very stimulating to us, but when your heart is connected to Allah, I can imagine that feels amazing. Even like with prayer, right, a lot of us, because of that lifestyle that we live, I think uh, more so in the West, um, it's a very busy lifestyle. And you know, as we grow up, right, as, when we're kids, like I give an example of my son Musa. Uh, I pick him up from school, and if it's raining, right, he's stepping on each puddle. Right, I'm not even noticing. So I ask some of my clients uh, w when we do the meditation stage. I say, "What's the last time you remember stepping on a puddle of water on the floor?" And they say, "I can't remember. Maybe like months ago, years ago." I said, "What's the last time you remember?" Um, Trainers are more expensive when you get older. I don't yeah. want to be stepping <laughs> in puddles. Yeah, there's definitely that part of it. So I'll ask them, like, um, "What's the last time you remember doing wudu and noticing the water go down the sink?" And saying no, I never pay attention to that You know these basic things um, What's the last time you remember Focusing on your breathing And they won't remember I say why Because whilst I was doing will do I was thinking about work I was thinking about mm -hmm. my build And because when we grow up yeah, The responsibilities increase Work, paying rent, bills And our mind gets filled up With this, this thought processes and so on And we really lose track of the present moment um, so that causes a lot of issues Like again, you know, I like to give personal examples To give that understanding uh, I noticed a couple of months ago My work at my Tuskia and other, other things I'm on my phone a lot And a lot of times if I have some kind of disruption With my children or my wife It's because I'm on the phone When I'm not supposed to be on the phone mm -hmm. right? Um, at the dinner table Or when I'm picking up my son So I made these boundaries right? Even in recovery, boundaries are very important So I said when, when I'm going to school Maybe I can pick uh, When I'm going to school to pick up my child Maybe I can do some emails or so on mm -hmm. But when I'm with my son The phone has to be switched off mm -hmm. When I'm with my wife When I'm at the dinner table Phone has to be switched off Because majority of our arguments I notice are because I'm on the phone right? And this is another thing yeah, to build that nurturing environment a, a lot of us adults are falling into this unfortunately we become addicted to our phones and you know things apps like um said ahmed was mentioning apps like um instagram TikTok. Mm -hmm. they're built in this way i'm sure there's psychology behind it psychologists that are giving advice uh, every clip gives you this um dopamine hit especially TikTok. Right? It's designed in this way. The algorithm works in a certain way where it'll, it'll push videos that people watch all the way and comment and it's more exciting and thrilling. And my friend recently said that his sister-in-law, she's young, like, I don't know the exact age, but maybe 12, 13. And they go, she's always on TikTok. And when she's not on TikTok, she's like a zombie. She's very down, frustrated. And she's happy when she's on TikTok, subhanAllah. Because, you know, the brain is getting tuned up to that. So coming back to the present moment is very important for us to learn those grounding techniques like, you know, touching, smelling, hearing, seeing and find these entry points into the now. Because if we don't do that, you know, we have the, this different kind of statements about the thoughts that we get, right? Uh, 6,000, 70,000 in one um, article, 70,000 thoughts a day. So we need to really start, first of all, looking at what are these thoughts, processing all these thoughts that are coming to our mind, and then learning to live in the moment and learning to ignore and not follow each thought, not judge every thought, right? And, uh, you know, because that when you're in the present moment, it's doing the same thing that acting out was providing you. Right? But it's doing it in a healthier way In a halal way And you're allowing to be in the present moment And you're in a state of peace and contentment And people only escape When they're in a state of 
discontentment, when they're in a state of unease, when that internal conflict is strong, right? And I'll just finish off with this. I have like the simple equation of addiction. Yeah, I say life plus internal conflict equals addiction, right? For for addicts. So you know we're going through our life daily struggles, our day to day life, and then uh, if you add to that an internal conflict. Yeah, to whatever's going on, you know, work stress, you get in an accident and you're always beating up yourself about it, that is going to lead to addiction. Life minus the internal conflict, or, you know, lowering that internal conflict or dissolving it equals sobriety, right? So life plus internal conflict equals addiction. Life minus internal conflict equals sobriety. So that's what we need to work towards. Mashallah, to such amazing from advice from both of you so far. Um, in particular, I think what you mentioned, Abu Musa, about trying to consciously be present I think that's such amazing advice and something that I'll definitely take away just even from little things when you are actually doing wudu or, or you're or you're with your child or with your spouse you are really there with them a hundred percent and you're and that's that's a really huge part of being content and having contentment in your life is being in that moment a hundred percent um and you're not always thinking well why am I feeling unhappy or unfulfilled perhaps it is because your mind is just everywhere and you're never there in those in those moments really um i guess the next thing i wanted to ask you both a little bit more about was um some of the negative connotations that we've already touched on in terms of stigma around mental health conditions around mental health concerns but also stigma in the muslim community about pornography and just addiction in general to the range of things that we've already mentioned is there notes comments that you can make on how that stigma could be lowered at it as in you know within an individual themselves or within our within the community see there's a lot there right and we need to take some time to maybe unpack it but in regards to lowering that stigma i'm not sure if we want to right and i might sound a bit mm. different to the both of you but that stigma is functional that stigma prevents people from going into it, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, we want to keep a balance, mm -hmm. right? We don't want that stigma to now prevent those who have fallen into it from seeking help. So I get where you're coming from, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, I, I'm unsure of how to sort of um, uh, go past it. It's like anxiety. Anxiety is functional. Allah has created us mm -hmm. with the capacity to feel the whole range of emotions that we feel because there's a reason for it. But there's certain emotions and feelings that we don't want to accept. But there's a reason behind them. Shame stops us from doing things which uh, we wouldn't want which could potentially be harmful, right? So there is a level of stigma that I, I, I don't want to completely take away. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to. I don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But there does need to be perhaps education at the same time where, okay, you know, you are not your addiction, yeah. right? You are not your addiction. You, we, in, in Islam, we have this concept. We separate the sin from the sinner, mm -hmm. right? So um, go see, let's, let's seek help for the issue that we have, but let's not break down all walls and barriers is to think that this is that there's there's nothing completely wrong with it no porn is very detrimental to society as are other um uh, other things so i wouldn't necessarily want to take it away mm. completely but i would want to uh, uh you know help uh, services which allow people to seek the help to be more known yes. out there so to provide that kind of education inshallah so inspirited minds is great for that you guys have a brilliant outreach program and uh, the, the work that you do Inshallah. Um, now, in terms of stigma, in terms of just mental health in general, that's a different, <laughs> slightly different, right? So, from based on my experience, I think stigma um, uh, in regards to mental health within the Muslim community has decreased. I think it has, uh, well, stigma towards mental health has gone down in the wider community uh, in general, right? And as a result, it has also uh, decreased within the Muslim community to an extent. I say particularly with sisters. Right, sisters uh, and the age range could vary. I'd say anything from uh, teens to up to perhaps fifties, um, perhaps a little bit older, maybe as well. Mm. Uh, my experience with uh, that area isn't so much, but within Muslim young men, for sure, the stigma with Muslim young men and mental health has decreased a lot. Uh, young Muslim men, I'd say under the age of thirty-five, mm. are really open to seeking help for mental health. Mm. Above that, not so much. So there is still work to be done there. There is still a lot of work to be done in terms of seeking help. Now. For me, I think the issue is actually more linguistic mm -hmm. than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I say, when we talk, say mental health, what images come to your mind? Yeah. 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 So um, it's like 
for me because I've been in the field yeah. obviously I talk about the neurology side yeah. of it the neuroscience and so on and um, basically you know the brain patterns and yeah. these kind of things what's so going on you're in the field so you're educated about it yeah. but generally if you speak to somebody the, um, let's look at the word mental growing up it's ah uh, you're mental i.e. you're unstable psychologically mental asylum it's an, it has a negative connotation yeah, so when people hear yeah when someone health. who doesn't so when people hear the word mental health they think okay my mental health is fine i'm not unstable because it's that's like can you feel more vulnerable than to think that there's something uh, mentally unstable about yourself but mental health doesn't mean just that mental health has a far wider uh, uh meaning far broader meaning and even when it comes to for example movies etc they've sort of distorted the images of people who have things which uh uh, like schizophrenia, like uh, borderline personality disorder, etc. There are many, many functional people who have these diagnoses and can contribute to life and live a healthy life the best that they can and aren't going around as mass murderers or etc. etc. So um, th there is still a lot of work to be done. Some of it is linguistic, as I say, the words that we use. But I think uh, with the enormous amount of work going into the mental health field, I think within 10, 15 years or so, it will, it will be a different landscape as well, inshallah. I think a lot more people will be open to it. I think that's the direction we're heading in. That's, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think definitely, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I agree with what you said about um, uh, how the media presents it as well. I mean, if you saw movies five, ten years ago, you, if it was the word mental health, you may see something like a mental health hospital or people acting abnormally or uh, with serious issues. Yeah, but alhamdulillah, I feel like the world is heading in the right direction, even the Muslim community. But I think there's an the aspect of um, the issue of that kind of generational thing as well. Like going back one, two generations, I think our parents or grandparents or great grandparents at that time, there was a lot of wars going around in the world. World War Two, there were wars in the subcontinent, wars in Africa and the Arab world. And I think that has definitely affected a lot of individuals. And it's that kind of generational trauma and not you can't you know uh, say that everyone is going through this, but it's quite common. In my experience, I've seen that um, older individuals, maybe uh, two generations ago, they um, maybe a bit more harsh or their personalities are different because they've gone through trauma and they don't even realize and it's passing down this trauma. And then there's the idea of you can't mention your problems, don't talk about your issues. Mm -hmm. That's a sign of weakness. But in UK, we have. Uh, one of the highest rates of male suicide and people what are people doing instead of talking they're looking down on talking but things that are acceptable are let's go smoke weed let's go drink alcohol let's go uh, visit escorts to so this is different how coping mechanisms yeah, instead this, of talking. these are their coping mechanisms unfortunately but the better thing from a dean or, or the logical thing would be to work around you know your kind of um, issues that you're uh, you are having reach out for help reach out for you know counseling or therapy work and um but alhamdulillah i feel like we're heading in the right direction people are definitely getting a better understanding of it and uh, inshallah things will get better inshallah um my next question for both of you is um all to do with preventative measures so either for an adult or parents or indeed teenagers listening or, or watching this, what kind of preventative measures could they think about acting on in terms of um, not becoming addicted to pornography? Abu, Abu Musa mentioned a lot of it in the beginning in regards to custodio and the filters and things like that. And they can't be underestimated. Um, I would extend that to movies and the type of content you allow in your home because they would act as a gateway to watching other things. Um, the reality is when it comes to addiction, the thing that you want to do more than anything else is you want to create distance between yourself and the thing that you're addicted to, whether that be a substance, whether that be porn, whether that be behavioral kind of things like gaming, etc. cetera. Um, you want to create distance. So in order to maintain that distance, what can you do? And I think I said that a few times, but you participate in life, right? So you find out, okay, um, what is it that I... What is it that I'm feeling? Because when you know what you're feeling, you know what you need. You know what you're missing. Is it social connections? Most likely, I, when I speak to my clients, I ask them, when you're with your friends, do you have this? Do you have the urge to go relapse? And they'll say no. Why? Because you're connected. 
you're doing something, you're emotionally connected with people. Is it that? Okay, how's your spiritual life? How's your relationship with Allah? The most important relationship we have in life is with Allah. Right? How's that going? Um, that that kind of thing. You know, uh, basic needs. We've got like Maslow's kind of hierarchy of needs in a little bit. Right? How stable are you? Was you you know what are your what are, are you happy in the work that you're doing in the job that you're doing in your career path? Are you happy in your relationship with your wife or lack not being in a relationship? For example, what's that? What's that like? Right? Your family dynamics, these sorts of things. So, to helping address these types of issues will help you in terms of this in, in, in terms of staying away from porn. Right, but in the beginning, or any other kind of addiction. But in the beginning, also. Uh, but if you had to kind of break that down a little bit more, it's kind of set goals, have aspirations, think to yourself as uh, life is bigger than just that one thing that you're doing as well. What other aspects of your life are there? Are you a, are you a father? Are you a son? Are you a wife? Are you a sister? Are you a daughter? Are you a brother? What are you? What do you do? What's your role? Find a role. Finding a role for yourself can be can be extremely beneficial. So, for example, one of the recent things that um, like we talk about career, right? And we talk about what is it that you want to um, do in life. But one of the things that kind of brings people satisfaction is doing what's needed to be done in that moment. So um, it's not that I want to go and um, I have these um, humongous ambitions to have humong you know, great projects. That's good to have. But in the moment, are you just thinking about that and not doing anything? Because that's probably going to make you feel pretty bad. Like you haven't made anything of your day But guess what Doing something mundane Which might sound mundane But just like Cutting your nails and having a shower Can make you feel a lot better Like if a little bit more productive Doing things like Okay there's rubbish there And I haven't taken it out Let me go take that out Can make you feel a bit more productive You know um, Realistic achievable things That you're supposed to do Right That really you're supposed to do Doing things for other people Is extremely powerful Right I'm washing the dishes now Because mom doesn't have to do it my wife doesn't have to do it, right? That can make you feel like you've done something in your day as opposed to this inner self-critic which will come to you at a certain point, bring you down, take you down that same rabbit hole where you're going back to the addiction. Just participating in life with these small things can be very helpful. You know, you asked a question earlier regarding horror stories, right? Um, you know, and, and, and we, we, when we say that, we think about like the most craziest things. Tell me something I haven't heard of in a kind of sense, right? There's a story kind of, not yourself, I'm just saying there's a story kind of narrative from it. But really, a person who isn't able to connect with other people is a major thing. It might not sound so big, but it's major. To be able to do that isn't nothing. It's It's something. It's big to be able to connect with people, to have relationships, to have uh, friends, to have family that you can talk to, have all of these kind of things, and to uh, uh, then to take the steps to 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 get to that point where you have these relationships can be very fruitful in terms of dealing with the addiction. Yeah, so we can't underestimate the little things in life. That's what makes life. That's what life is. Generally, life is you know the whole eighty twenty kind of rule. Uh, rule eighty percent of life is probably pretty mundane, but make sure you're still participating in that. Occasionally, you might have things which are you know, uh, out of the ordinary or you, you very special, but learn to enjoy the other aspects of life as well, or at least deal with it better. Yeah, um, you summed up really nice, alhamdulillah. But um, similar things to as I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast about installing filters. Mm. Yeah, and let's get that done because you see, we don't. We struggle to take action we need to inshallah get that done so everyone watching this try to get filters installed by the next day give it like a timeline of you know before 12 a.m in the night uh, get the filters installed uh, educate your children about the issues the dangers of this mm -hmm. and also to have that you know healthy environment at home so as parents, we need to be very careful how we act around our children because uh, they're like a sponge, right? They just absorb e everything that your children are going to become basically you in a sense, right? They're going to learn from you. You're their main teacher, the mother, the father, and they're going to develop that conditioning that you provide them. So it's not easy. It's a journey in itself. But even as parents, you see, like we say about wives who are uh, whose husbands are suffering from this, um, they should 
get coaching they should work on uh, things themselves as well because it's not about him he has his own journey right but you know they relate it to themselves a lot so it's about you you know you need to recover likewise as parents we need to take care of our emotional and spiritual health and only then we will be able to be beneficial and be there for our children like with anyone in this life right no one's going to be there for you after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala people can only be there for you so so long right an addict heroin addict for instance if he ends up on the streets or in jail the mother will try I mean I've seen these things because I've been around these environments the mother the father the brother sister they will only be around you for so long they have their own life to live as well I mean mothers and father you know your parents will try their best but eventually it's going to be a cut off point so no one's going to be there for you after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the key thing your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that it is you who is going to take care of yourself and even if you have struggles in your family like a family member has cancer or something you need to prioritize yourself first right you need to be selfish to be selfless because if you now lose your sanity and you are not able to take care of yourself how are you going to take care of that family member who has cancer how are you going to take care of your elderly father mother so really prioritize yourself in that sense i'm sure you understand where i'm coming from and uh, do that in your uh, life at home as well so you can be good role models for your children so build that environment and uh, teach your children healthy coping mechanisms right like you know get them into sports that dopamine release make them enjoy life if you can afford it go on holidays um as much as you can and you know make their life enjoyable yes make sure they are focusing on the academia and you know the islamic uh, guidance is there but along with that you need to make it enjoyable and create those healthy routines and um, basically so that they don't find things like pornography like weed alcohol or even music for some and use that as a kind of main breakaway mechanism because that's what it is with addicts a lot of addicts relapse so if they're in uni they relapse at the end of semester Right, after the three months of hard work a lot of working individuals they'll work hard Monday to Friday and relapse on the weekend these are some of the patterns and that addiction has become their getaway mechanism so we need to replace that and start off young for the children have healthy basically coping mechanisms inshallah that's a really important point particularly with the children as well spending time with your kids right because we can sometimes often pawn our children off to YouTube give them a device let them do with it but what are they doing there? They're, they're, they're developing that kind of copimism of um, escapism, right? Yeah. Uh, cons- consumption, consuming, getting lost into into a show or whatever. But really what they want is to spend time with you. So taking them football, taking them sports, doing these kind of things uh, will, will help your children start young. And the filter thing can't be underestimated either. You know, the uh, it helps with the process of creating distance and this the reality is like the studies have shown the less and it's what Allah has said in the Quran, right? You know, La Takra Buzin on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asks us to lower our gaze, right? The less you look at the less you the less you look at porn, the less you want to look at porn. So when you have these filters and they stop you from doing it, the reality is that the harder it becomes for you to access it, the less you will access it. So put these things into place. Make it difficult for you. Get rid of your stash. Right, in regards to addiction, the first step is to get rid of your stash. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's weed, get rid of it. You know, delete the numbers, the, 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 wherever the alcohol might be, throw it away. In terms of your phone, as well, in terms of porn as well, wherever it could be, wherever you're accessing it through, create distance between you and that. Make it harder for you to be able to access it, particularly in the beginning, where your, your, coping mechan- your other coping mechanisms haven't been built up yet. You haven't worked on them yet. Right, so in that beginning, you just have to deal with it you know create keep that distance and uh join a support program for sure with any addictions having a support program and having people who are going through the same things as you can be really really helpful like i have people who come to me uh for this addiction issue but often i will refer them on towards something like my tuskia because they can offer something that i can't as an individual which is that support network that whole support program and having that is really important amazing um We've actually drawn to a close on our podcast in terms of questions. Um, it's been amazing to have both of you and, and learn so much from both of you. And inshallah, it will be it will be beneficial to our viewers and our listeners. I wonder if there was any last kind of comments or things that you wanted to say that I didn't ask about in terms of the work that you do or any last pieces of advice at all um, in the realm that we've spoken about today. 
Ah, uh, your question is really good. I think they pretty much covered anything I'd like yeah. to say. Do you have anything? Yeah, no, definitely. What I would say is, if someone is suffering from this problem, uh, get help. It doesn't have to be Matheskia. It can be any recovery program. Uh, break the isolation and get help with it. At least find out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, because you don't want it to go and disrupt your future life. Um, because many people have mentioned that it's affected years of university for them. People, I mean, I've heard of stories of individuals being uh, caught watching child pornography, someone at work, have been banished from you know their town, having to leave their town, having to leave their work. So it's a very dangerous pathway. Um, and uh, see a lot of the problems in, in marriage that it's causing. So definitely get help and uh, find out if you have the problem and work on it, inshallah, uh, sooner rather than later. Inshallah. Thank yeah. you so much, both of you, you again. You're welcome. Thank you. Jazakallah khair for watching this episode of the Mindful Muslim podcast with Brother Ahmed Tomal and Brother Abu Musa. Inshallah, you found it a useful one, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Mindful Muslim podcast.